Hey folks, good evening. So this is FMA uh, discussion uh, 204. And tonight we have our guest, um, Sixth Westler. <laughs> so I hope I, I yeah, pronounced yeah. it properly. It's, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, sorry. everyone. Hi. Sorry if I'm, if I'm worth your name. But yeah, good evening, everybody. Good evening, sir. OK, so uh, tonight we're going, we're going to have a very interesting discussion because um, our guest is not just a prolific martial artist and also an FMA, but he's also a curator of the German German Blade Museum. German Blade yeah. Museum, Deutsches so, Klingen Museum, yes. Yeah. And so we are also going to hear uh, some of the researches and one of the research that he presented in Cardiff in 2016. So good evening, sir. Good evening. Okay. Hi. Good Thanks evening. for the invitation and hello to everyone. Hi. I am, I am, I am honored. We are honored in mm -hmm. FMA discussion to have you um, as our guest. Thank you. Yeah. So if you're watching, guys, please uh, click the like button and most especially the hard button and start commenting <laughs> because according to algorithms, that's basically where we get more, uh, okay. we get better, <laughs> better numbers in Facebook. Uh, Please say hi, and also please say where you're watching from. Okay, so let's start with your martial arts journey. Hmm. Um, I tried to keep it short. Um, I was um, uh, a little boy, nine years old, um, when my parents weren't at home and my uncle was taking care of me. And he let me watch, as every good uncle should. Um, he allows you things that your parents would never allow you to do. So he allowed me to watch uh, a movie uh, late at night. And it was the 36th Chamber of Shaolin. That classic, oh, that's nice. yes. fantastic, classic Kung Fu movie. Yeah. And I was, sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I love it, that. It's fantastic. And um, I was nine years old back then. And that was really like a life changing moment. I'm like, oh, Oh my god what is this i want to be able to do this too so since then ba basically i was interested in martial interested in martial arts and then i started when i was 11 years old um with karate shotokan karate at my hometown and then a little bit later um parallelly i started with wing chun kung fu and a little bit later also parallelly with jiu jitsu uh, not brazilian jiu jitsu but an american jiu jitsu style um so there was, I had one evening off in the week or one day off where I wasn't training one of the other two martial arts that I was already practicing. So <laughs> I thought, okay, I could take the opportunity and start and train there. Um, and that was also the first time I was introduced to, to some stick and knife work because that jiu-jitsu style it was an eclectic style from the US. They had mixed several things and they had also integrated some Filipino martial arts. So this was the first time that I was using sticks and, and knives in training. And from then, there was a, a long journey. I um, trained several several styles, some longer, some shorter, some were just a glimpse. Um, what was a main influence for me then after my time in Shotokan was a time in Enshin Karate. Um, Enshin is a full contact karate style. Um, it's a, derived from Kyokushin, and the rule set is pretty similar to Kyokushin. And I was fighting there in many competitions, um, and I did my black belt in Enshin Karate. And at the same time, in our gym, in our dojo, we also did Muay Thai. So I also took part in, in Thai boxing um, competitions. Um, and then in 2000, I moved to Tübingen in southwestern Germany. And very close to Tübingen, and <clears throat> only 10 kilometers away, there's Reutlingen. And Reutlingen was the headquarters, the European Packetitescher headquarters back then. And Uli Weitle was teaching there. And as soon as I arrived in the area, I heard about Uli Weitler, or I had even heard about him before, and I heard a lot about Pekita Tirsha and the Filipino martial arts, and especially that style of Filipino martial arts. So I joined um, Uli's training in May 2000 and uh, stayed his student ever since. So this is now for the last 21 years, this is my main martial art. Uh, this is what I would say if somebody asks me, what style do you do? Yeah, I do I do Kali, I do what I learned from, from Uli. And um, yeah, after that, I still kept on yeah, trying out other things, some longer, some shorter. I did some, some Western boxing as well. I did uh, Olympic fencing at the university um, in Tübingen for one and a half years or so. I did Aikido for a while. Um, so yeah, many different things. And since 2008, um, I've been following Mol Morne on his seminars when he comes to, to Germany to teach here. 
Um, so the Silat uh, Sufyan Beladiri is also uh, yeah, an influence on me, and I always call it like my my love affair. So uh, the Kali is my is my <laughs> my wife, so to say. But the Silat <laughs> Silat Sufyan is my is my secret love affair. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't have regular training in that, but I love going there for the for the seminars, and it definitely also influenced um, the way I'm thinking about about martial arts. Um, yes, so there's many things that I did did over the years. Yeah, one thing that that I noticed with your other traditional martial arts is that they're all combative by nature. Yeah. So did, did, did for example, did you compete in all of them, like in uh, in uh, in sparring or in competitions? No, I competed in um, Muay Thai and in ancient karate. Um, in Shotokan karate, that was usually Shotokan list here is done as a like zero contact format, like you could see at the Olympics now. And mm -hmm. back then, um, that wasn't that wasn't my teacher, my sensei. He wasn't interested in that. He was more yeah. the the old school way, um, old school, which yeah. which I liked because um, <clears throat> I was from an early age on. I was always interested in that, as you said, that combative aspects. Like how yeah. would it be to really fight? Um, and this is also the reason then why I went into the into the full contact styles and why I competed in in Anshin and in Muay Thai because I wanted to get the experience what it would would be like um, to fight. I guess if I had been like 15 or 20 years younger and MMA had been as big as it is today, then yeah. probably I would have started with MMA right away because obviously right. that yeah. would have been what fascinated what what fascinated me um, as a boy. So these are the two arts in which I competed. And then, of course, in Kali, we have our fight days where we fight full contact with glove and, and fencing mask. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, of course, is among friends. So even yeah. though yeah. you know these formats, even though sometimes it's very rough and sometimes yeah. bones would break, it's still not the same as, for example, when I was fighting Muay Thai, at least for me, because there the also the emotional level is very different. It's like two guys go in and you know you want to destroy the other guy. Whereas in the Kali match, the other one is still a friend or, or a guy that you, you train with. So usually it's not, for me at least, it's not as um, brutal as the Muay Thai yeah. matches were. Mm. No. So, I mean, from, from with, with all the martial arts that you, you have studied before you went to Kali, um, what do you think, like, the attributes, the mindset that you managed to bring to Kali as well? Mm. So when you started... Uh, several, several things. Um, the one thing um, that I got from Shotokan is this work hard, work diligent, have discipline and, and stick with it, stick with that thing for a long time. Yeah. Um, my, my teacher in Shotokan, um, he laid great emphasis on this, yeah, this, this discipline and, and keeping with it. Um, and when I started to train this, I wasn't by far, I wasn't the best in in the group yeah there were like 30 35 young kids and many of them were, were better sportsmen or sports women um than i was yeah but i really wanted to do this so when i was like 18 or 19 years old all the other ones had left but i was still there and by then i had become proficient so this is the one the mindset that i brought in into my my kali training and the other thing that i brought in definitely from the from the full contact martial arts is just this okay <laughs> Once it starts, uh, <laughs> things start to explode. Then they then they explode. Yeah. Also, that reliance um, that you know that you can handle yourself more or less um, in a in a full contact fight. Yeah. This is something that I took over into Kali. All right. Good. So, um, so now that basically you're also like practicing um, SSBD with with more. Is yeah. there is there like what are the things that you find like common? Let's say from from your all the other traditional martial arts with Kali and with SSBD, mm. the commonalities and maybe the differences. Yeah. Um, this is <clears throat> in a way it's hard for me to judge, and I do not want to misjudge the SSBD because as I saw, as I said, I know SSBD from the seminars and the time I spent mm. there with Mo and Kali. I know yeah, from the inside out because I've been training. Yeah for a really long time but when i was um, in 2008 when i was there for the first seminar with mall that was really striking because of course i had seen other filipino martial martial arts styles um which had similarities with my way of kali but not everything was the same whereas when i trained with mall for the first time especially with a knife 
things were so similar, like they even had the same drills, they gave yeah. them different names, but the footwork was very similar, um, the drills were similar, and the approach was similar. The, this is a bladed martial art, so I felt immediately <laughs> at, home, at home there. <laughs> yeah. So at the beginning I was like, hey man, this, this is just like, this is just like Pekka de what I'm training. Once I started to see other things from the Sila Sofian, I, I understood that no, there is a difference. When it comes to the Kuntao things, um, mm. this is this is more different from the from the Kali that I was used to. Um, but I think that there is an overlap where they can at least communicate mm. very mm. well with each other. And one time at a university um, conference in 2015, I think it was. We even did a little, 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 little experiment. I invited a friend, uh, Grant. I invited him to um, to, a, to a workshop, and we split the group. And I taught them a Kali drill, and he taught them more or less the same drill in the Sila Sofian way. And then we mixed the group, and we didn't explain anything and just let them play with each other. And of course, it communicated well. Yeah. So there is this, there is this overlap. I That's guess. a nice experiment. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. It was fun to do. It was fun, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> did, did you manage to record it or something like video or document? No, we, it? Or it we was didn't. Just for fun? Yeah, we didn't. We should have. We should have done. Actually, we should yeah. have done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because I mean, in any in any martial arts conference, that's a good. That's a good. Basically, that's a good yeah. presentation. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Okay. So uh, let's uh, say. Uh, hi to Miguel Ruby from Rancho Cordova. Hello. Okay, and we have Julius as well, one of the moderators of our FMA discussion. And he has a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you practice magic with a K? Of, of course I don't. I'm a good, uh, wait, if you can, I don't know if you can see it. There's my, <laughs> there's my mother Mary in the background. I'm a good Catholic Christian, so I wouldn't <laughs> practice. Okay. <laughs> even though even though i try what i what i um when i start to to teach i try to do a little magic but that's a that's a different way of magic i guess okay all right fair enough fair enough fair enough <laughs> okay so you 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 uh so how long have you been practicing martial arts for now from the age of nine from the no uh when i was nine oh, I, oh, when i was nine i saw the i saw that 11, 11, 11, 11 and i started when i was 11 and i and now yeah. i'm 40 43 so for 32 years yeah wow that's a lot years. yeah and um for those of you who don't oh, well uh, no um six is also yeah, as i've said already the curator of the german blade uh, museum and because of this you uh encounter quite a lot of uh, like different researches, different materials, and even managed to get a little bit into HEMA. Yeah. Yeah, because of because exactly. of your position. So um, um, can you talk us through with 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 your with your um, position as a curator? Yeah. How, how exciting it is? <laughs> it's well, um, I'm the I'm not um, the only the curator. Curator is like part of the work that I do, but I'm the di director of the museum. Oh, director, the works, sorry. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm the I'm the boss of the museum. No problem. But this is um, the being the curator is actually probably more fun if I only was the <laughs> curator. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, sorry, I demoted um, you. <laughs> as the <laughs> as the as the director, um, much of my work is organizational work as well. Yeah, um, the finances of the museum, um, the the staff of the museum managing them, our um, PR and so forth and so forth, um, our digitalization project. So everything basically that we do because we are a small museum, we have a small staff. So everything that we do more or less goes over my, my desk at some point. Yeah. But of course, what I love to do there um, is to get into contact with the, with the objects themselves. We have a very large collection of etched weapons um, from all over the world, um, mainly, of course, from Europe and mainly from Solingen. Solingen is the famous city of blades. Um, it was one of the most important um, blade producing, producing cities in Europe or in the world and still mm. is basically. Mm. They still, still is, yes. Exactly. Yeah. They still produce knives of all kinds from razors to pocket knives to, to cutlery and everything. Um, so we have this very large collection of, of edged weapons um, and I'm 
I'm working with them, we try to research them, questions like how were they produced, who made them, who made them in which way, how were they, how were they transmitted from one place to the other, stuff like that. Um, but the question that is interesting for me, of course, is also like how do they, how do they handle, how do they feel? Uh, so I, I'm in the luxurious position that as a martial artist, as a Kali guy, I can also, if I want to take a, a rapier from the 16th century in my hands, I just go to the archives and take it. Yeah. Of course, I have to be careful and I have to yes, wear gloves, of, yes. of course, so I don't bash them against against the, uh, against the tire stack or something. Um, but uh, I'm allowed, or well, I'm, even, I'm even supposed to wield them because obviously having them taken them in your hand gives you more information about them yes, than just seeing course. them hanging there. Of course. Yeah. Of course. I mean, if you need an assistant. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can come for for a one month internship. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'll try to work on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, because I remember when I went to the Leeds uh, Armory. Yeah. I was saying myself, I was like, oh wow. Can I touch them? No, you can't. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I said that yesterday, and I will say it again because I have to also advertise for my my good friends um, over at the Royal Armories in Leeds. If you are in the UK or if you're going there, go to Leeds, go to the Royal Armories and have a look at it. It's one of the most important um, weapon museums of the world, definitely. Yeah. And um, fantastic. Yeah. You yeah. Should, you should just go there. It's worth. Yeah. It. Not, not just for one day. You you want. Yeah. Be able to fit everything in one day. Yeah. Two or three days for 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 the complete experience. I yeah. would say. Yeah. Take it from me. I only went there for one day. I was like, this is too short, man. We have to <laughs> it in Paris. It was like the first. I think in the first first few floors, we were like, okay, let's have time. Let's take time, like that, to to to, to, like, to take a look at the at the uh, displays, take pictures and everything, and then after a while, what? We don't have enough. We don't have enough time anymore. <laughs> Zoom to the other room. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's 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 huge. It's really huge, and they have it a is. lot of stuff. Uh, and of course, like all museums, um, at least all museums that I know, they even have much more stuff back in the archives, in the vaults, where you cannot go as a regular visitor. Yes, but when exactly. I when I visited them for the last time, um, Henry Yellow is is a good friend there. Um, he's the um, head uh, for the edge weapons department. Um, I, I went to the vaults with him, so I could also see the stuff that usually they have not on display. So that's another luxury of being a museum director yourself. That when you when you visit your colleagues, of course you get entry also to the to the hidden things. So <laughs> it was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, Julius has another question here. How well are you read up on the the vault? Thibault, now yeah, is, and I know um, all of them, the one that I, but knowing and being well read up is two different things because I don't speak or I can't read um, the original languages. Yeah. And that's a huge problem uh, in the, in the, when you, when you start to deal with historical martial arts, yeah, um, early modern martial arts in this case, um, of course, you would look into the manuscripts uh, or fight books. The ones that you're mentioning here are not manuscripts. They are not written by hand. They are printed books. So you would look at the fight books. And um, if you do this, and if you want to do this properly, you have to be able to read and to understand the language. Yeah? It's not enough to, to have, a, to have a, um, an interpretation of that no. yeah, or, a trans or a translation. Of course, that a translation can give you an idea what it is, but if you want to delve deep into that, um, you would have to be able to read the original language. And in the case of the authors you mentioned, I'm not able to do this. So of course, um, I have, I have um, seen the books and I have read the translations or at least parts of them, but I'm not able to read the book in itself. Yeah, I am, on the other hand, able to read the early high, um, modern German books, so that German corpus of the fighting books. But um, if you speak about the Thibaut, it's nice that you mentioned that, because um, Thibaut is, is, even though I can't read the, the old French, um, it's probably my, my favorite uh, fencing book, because we have uh, a copy at the Kling Museum. We own one ourselves. Um, and the book is from 1630. It has 430 pages, and it's friggin' huge. So it's like, <laughs> it's like, 
70 centimeters high and if you if you open it like wow. 90 centimeters wide or so and it's the one of the most luxurious books that were ever produced in copper engraving it was paid for um, by the royal court by the french royal court and 15 or 18 copper engravers over a longer period worked on that book so it's marvelous it's absolutely fantastic um and as i said i know i'm so because i have the book there right in front of me i'm i'm able to studying it directly I can uh, look at the images and I can, I have a translation next to it. So I guess I get an idea what it means. And I speak enough French to sometimes understand some lines and also because it's about a topic that I'm familiar with, it's about fencing. Um, so this is the one of the three that you mentioned that I know, know most about, but I couldn't claim that I'm a Thibault specialist because to be one, you would have to be able to read and understand the French. Uh, otherwise, it's just uh, yeah, second-hand knowledge that you gather. Uh, to give a little bit of uh, uh, context or per perspective to our viewers, uh, the three people that uh, Julius mentioned, can you, can, you, can you describe them briefly? Yeah. How do they like compare to each other or even time, general? Or yeah, so this is, this is um, early modern age. Um, Thibault, as I said, he wrote his book um, in the early 17th century. Um, and unfortunately for him, he died just before, <laughs> before the book was published. Um, oh. So the book, book has a publishing date, 1627, but it was published in 1630. Um, mm -hmm. So this is that time frame. And he was a, he was a Belgian guy teaching in France but he was teaching Spanish uh, school of fencing. So Destreza, he's, he's part of the Destreza. And, and Narva is, is um, also a Spanish guy. I'm, I have to admit, I don't know the, um, the dates okay. um, by heart, but his um, fencing manual um, is interesting in so far, or at least the one that I'm familiar with. I don't know if he wrote several ones. Um, it's interesting because he has one um, scene where he describes so what would you do if you are equipped with a rapier and you are used to our way of fencing but you are fencing against a turk i think he says so against an an oriental warrior who has a curved saber like how would you have to have to work against them and priya the third one i have to admit i'm not familiar with so okay uh, okay team, thank you team yeah. okay. all right okay cool so we 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 like, for example, these uh, books that you've read in in Hema. How how are you going? How do you like? Uh, would you correlate them with Kali with with the mm. So do you see any any similarities? As, at least with with Pekiti Tersha, mm. which which is the one that you which is the one that you practice. Do you mm. see any similarities? Any yeah? Any commonalities? Anything that uh, worth uh, mentioning to the to the public as far as uh, yeah yeah there is <clears throat> there are several level levels on which you could answer that that question um, so the one the first thing that that comes to the mind of people is like um, in a technical level how similar is it yeah and um, of course if you say yeah European fight books that spans a long time frame various weapons various styles of fencing so these things can be very different, but you will find, of course, um, you will find some manuals um, where as a Kali guy, you would glance through and you would say, oh, okay, I know almost all of that. I know from my style. So especially when it comes to, to Mesa fencing, uh, Langes Mesa, which is a weapon that has more or less the dimensions of the, the Kali-like like sword. Um, probably a little, little bit longer. Um, but there you, you'll see that they have um, that they depict many techniques that you would immediately recognize from your FMA training. Yeah? So a lot of what we would call payong or other people call umbrella yeah. things and yeah. the, the second hand that enters the try to grabs and control the other weapon um, stuff where you like enter and roll around and, and hit them. So this seems very similar, but I think we have to be careful yeah? because I'm a Kali guy and I've been training this for a long time. And I've been trained, especially in my system, to interpret yeah, other things, to, to lay my patterns over new kinds of movements. So when you give a book like this to me, of course, I will find yeah. things that remind me of Kali. So I don't know. And, and it's just a book with some descriptions and some, some stills, some paintings, so we, some drawings. So 
we don't know what it exactly looked like when they moved. Yeah, but I guess there is a similarity on that. And then on another level, which mm -hmm. probably is even more interesting um, for me, is the the emphasis that is laid on the geometry, on the idea that fighting is based in geometry. And this is the thing that I also pointed out in that that video clip that you that you linked uh, for me from Cardiff University, um, that these ideas. Um, are very old, uh, that fighting can be based in geometry uh, and based in geometry in a way that it even or almost becomes supernatural in a way. Uh, the idea back in the, in the fighting books goes parallel with the general idea of that time of European uh, mindset, of European culture, which is that the world is built by God and is made beautiful and complete and he built the world according to mathematics and geometry so something that is geometrical that is beautiful is also true because this is the way our god created it and then in the second step so if you have a fighting system that is based on geometry then this fighting system must be true you know, and it will grant you superiority so this is the this is the idea behind yeah um, and you find that you find that idea very very early on in Italian fencing manuals. For example, Filippo Vardi, um, he was writing between 1482 and 1487. His book he says that um, fencing is born from geometry. Yeah. And in that Thibaut that we just talked about, you have super complicated footwork pattern, which he calls a magic circle. So there we are, uh, Julius. There we are again at the grimoire. Yeah. He says he call it. Um, uh, circle mysterieux, so a mysterious circle. Yeah? And his idea is, if you are able to fight according to these geometrical patterns, you will win in your fight. And then I come to my own training uh, when I trained with Grandmaster Leo Gahe of the Pekete Tersha, and he said, because we have a system of geometrical equation, we have a system of non-counterability. Yeah. So this is there we have a difference of several hundred years, but it's exactly the same idea. Yeah? And this is the parallel that is the most interesting for me, much more than the some techniques or some movements that might be similar, that this idea about geometry was either given on or developed. I wouldn't give a definite answer to this, uh, developed at several places, but at least you find it in both of these of these combat systems. You know, with a with a time span of 500 uh, years and uh, several thousand kilometers in between, uh, so that's very interesting. Mm. Yeah, uh, going back, uh, it, uh, you already you already basically said that you 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 uh, talked about this in Cardiff. Would would you be able to give um, our viewers a little bit more of that uh, of that of that talk that you did in Cardiff? About the lines and circles in martial arts. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. This is yeah what what I just said. These these parallels or these lines of traditions. This is always what I'm interested in yeah, in in martial arts. Like, what do people think about martial arts, and why do they think it? And is their ideas are they transmitted to the next generation? Where will they pop up again? And um, in the talk, um, I was discussing the idea um, that um, you find. All over the internet in martial arts discussions again and again that the straight line is the shortest line and thus the best way to attack the opponent yeah you have to attack him in a straight line uh, with a straight punch or thrust um because it's the shortest way um and thus the quickest yeah mm. so you have an advantage to timing and this this is why it's the best way to attack yeah and you find that very prominently expressed by bruce lee he he wrote that explicitly like the the straight line the way of straight line punching that had, it needed a long time to develop but now we have it and that's the way of like scientific fighting yeah and then i looked at it like where else can you see this idea and where um, does it pop up yeah. and it pops up again and again in the in discussions uh, even nowadays and the funny thing is that i mean punching somebody in the straight line is definitely a valid attack <laughs> no doubt about that yes, exactly yeah. yes. there's like <laughs> no doubt about that but the idea the premise that lies behind it yeah which try to base it in geometry this is simply wrong yeah or you cannot transfer it because there's a difference between something being the shortest 
in something being the quickest. Mm. There's a huge difference. And the way I try to explain that, that there's a difference, is with a, a famous um, experiment from um, a Swiss mathematician from the 17th century. Um, his brother asked a question. His brother asked, like, if you have two points uh, in space and uh, you want to have a, a ball rolling from one point to the next point, on which kind, kind of plane would you have to connect these two points to have the ball the quickest way, to give the ball the, the quickest way? And everybody, everybody says intuitively, yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, just give it a straight and that's the shortest and thus it must be the quickest. Yeah, but it's not true. Yeah. In geometry, if you just put it on the table, yes, this is the shortest. Yeah. But as soon as you put it into the reality of physics, uh, this is the quickest way, yeah. not the shortest, but you have a parable, yeah. Mm. Yeah. you have a small curve um, which takes, for which the ball takes less time to go from point A to point B uh, than if it goes on the straight. Yeah. And this is then with a, like the, the most simple experiment you can, you can show already that the idea the shortest must be the quickest is not true as soon as you go into reality, into physical reality. And now our body is a machine that is much, much more complicated than just having a ball run from A to B. A to B yeah? So exactly, it's the brackets to chrome. Exactly. Yeah. So if I if I have to move my arm on a on a straight line, or if I throw it like this, or if I punch like this, or whatever, um, can be can have different speeds, uh, levels of speed. Yeah. And again, the the shortest way must not necessarily be the quickest. Yeah. Once again, in practical application, of course, you can base your fighting system on straight punches, and you can be very deadly with that, no doubt. Yeah, but it's just for me, it's about the mindset, the ideas yeah. that are behind. Yeah, people have always, we all have um, the intention to legitimize why what we are doing is correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we're not just standing there and punching the bag like this. Hey, that feels good. Yeah, we have to give it a, leg a legitimization like, ah, it's the straight way because it's the best. Yeah, and then another style comes and he would say like, no, you have to always do it in round circles yeah, because the world is round and this generates <laughs> the most power. Yeah, and they can, pro most probably they can hit frigging hard with that. Yeah. yeah, but that doesn't mean that their explanations are correct. Yeah, and what is interesting for me is like, like why do we need these explanations? Yeah, why do we need to tell ourselves that our martial art is true or is the best uh, or is the only way or stuff like that. Yeah. That's a nice point that you actually raised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because common source of argument in the yeah. arts community is I'm the best. <laughs> yeah. And you're nothing. Exactly. So, yeah. Okay. So um Okay, Julius made a comment here. If people don't believe you in FMA terms, just do it with a ramp and some hot wheel toys. Make a 45 degree angle ramp and yeah. mm. exactly. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is um when it is this um when I gave this talk in Cardiff, um I had it on a on a um simulation there in the video clip. But of course it's much cooler the way <laughs> you propose it to do it with actual um, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah sometimes, sometimes uh, for them to see it yeah. actually happening yeah. will will make them understand more than just thinking or visualizing. Yeah, because I mean, you, you can you sometimes you can manipulate what you visualize. So. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly, that's true. But the <clears throat> but uh, yeah. I mean, you could also read it up and um, try to um, try to reassess um the mathematics behind it was mm -hmm. only wrote back then but i guess for most people me included would be a bit too complicated so i like the idea with the <laughs> with the hot hot wheel story exactly <laughs> the, the thing that um i mean why people say yeah the thrust is the fastest um is true in in a way because usually systems that rely completely on the thrust would hold mm -hmm. the weapon in front of them so it's closer to the opponent anyway Whereas when you do it with like swinging strokes uh, with blows, then you have the weapon loaded somewhere on the shoulder. Yeah. So the distance already is longer than when you uh, have a thrust-based fencing system where you have the point right in front of the enemy. So 
the whole equation is it doesn't work out at the at the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Well, might as well. You just said his internet keeps cutting off. Yeah. Okay. Um, would you might would you care answering that? Did you get to ask yeah. the magic K the and magic. the re re yeah. remote question? Yet? <laughs> yeah. So once again, uh, I'm not studying magic. Um, and uh, not i'm not no i'm not practicing magic but um it's funny that you keep asking about the magic because it's a topic i like to talk about <laughs> actually um when i studied at university my main subject was um, history of religion i had three subjects history of religion um scandinavian studies and medieval history and in history of religion um magic theory but again from an academic perspective um was one of my my subjects for my final exams at the university so i'm very much interested in the ideas about magic and that's also a little bit similar to what i talked about before i'm also uh, i'm always interested in 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 yeah the, the the imaginary worlds that we as as humans create yeah and when we talk about magic in a in a martial arts uh, connection this is very interesting because you you, you find it so often in martial arts Obviously, people would like to um, to help themselves in that horrible, stressful situation. Uh, they need helpers, so they either pray to God, of course, they pray to their saints or their spirits, or they have small amulets around their neck. They have engravings on their weapon um, that give them that work as a charm and will make them invulnerable. You have invulnerable spells. You write them down on paper and then you swallow them, so the bullets of the enemy will not be able to harm you. All that practices, yeah. And once again, you find them in Europe. You find them in Asia. You find them everywhere. Uh, mm. They are they are um, intertwined with the development and martial of martial arts. Yeah. And of course, nowadays you could exclude them. Just okay. Mm -hmm. We are now we're enlightened people. We don't believe in that. We don't do that. Um, and I don't practice it. But it's still worth learning about it. And it's still worth understanding that for generations before us, that was a valid part of martial art. Yeah. And as a as a martial arts master, uh, of course, you were supposed to teach your students not only how to punch or kick. Yeah. But you were also supposed to teach them the right spells. Yeah. Or, for example, in German fighting uh, fight books from the 15th century, um, there you have tables for horoscopes, so that you would know, depending on which which star sign you are, um, on which day you should go into the fight, because then the stars will grant you victory. All that stuff. Yeah? So magic and martial arts have a lot to do with each other. Yeah, I think I I also like watch a uh, season one of uh, El Cid. And you, you can actually see, in, even in the dialogues there, that they do practice some kind of yeah. magic or like they do uh, believe heavily in superstition. Yeah, um, yeah Joe just made a comment there that a lot of top warriors and yep. make back then, yeah, not only were practitioners of martial arts blade, but they are also adept. So they're. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, you would have to. Uh, like often, you would have to specifically which treatise are we talking about from which author? Very often, we do not not, uh, do not know a lot about the authors, but um, you're right. And so, far, as I just mentioned, for example, in the Talhofer treatises, there you have um, these these astrological um, tables, uh, and there is an interconnection. Yeah. And I would go I would go even uh, given even further um, to understand. These books, you have to understand the whole cultural context. Yeah. So you you cannot just pick out some topics there and and um, highlight them. Yeah. You you have to understand the whole worldview. Like I, I said before about, for example, about the the ideas of geometry and the way people believed God had built the world. Yeah. Okay. Um, Camilo Agrippa, he was mostly, he was especially, he was a, he was an architect. He built several things in Rome that you can see still today. And once again, you have to understand the context. So um, Agrippa that um, you're mentioning now, um, he was an architect. And it's no wonder that he also emphasized the importance of geometry in fencing. Yeah, that's, that's exactly his, his uh, book came out in the middle of the 16th century. We have a copy at the Kling Museum. Thankfully, we have an original there. Oh, okay. Um, and um, 
there you can see how his how his work uh, as an architect and a mathematician and his fencing correlate again. Yeah. yeah, I think it might be fair to say that although you've got some some groups who practice uh, martial arts together with occultism, some maybe just like practice martial arts, but they tend to become more just like in the spiritual path, mm -hmm. not necessarily practicing occult as well. And some just practice martial arts completely devoid of uh, devoid of any uh, any kind of practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, are there any questions for six regarding still like magic and uh, geometry and martial arts before we move to his special project with uh, Solingen? <laughs> no. Okay. You mean okay? Okay. Just saw the last. Okay. There's also yes. a, a fencing master, uh, Camilo Agrippa. This is okay. Okay. So yeah, so you you're go you you basically part of your um, part of your project in the museum is this um, this um, project with Solingen with with regards to blades and was it like was it uh, making some of the old blades as well? Yeah, we. We um, try to represent the history of, of course, the the Blade City, yeah. and um, we try to to cooperate with with various people them uh, there and um, try to show what is going on today, yeah, the Blade production, but as also what has been going on um, in past ages, yeah. and that starts uh, obviously with with stone uh, Stone Age blades. Or with blades from bone or um, from from glass or whatever, and goes all the way uh, until today. And we try to um, show that in our exhibitions, but we also try to have events where we present that. Yeah. And so next year, um, at the 14th and 15th of May, we'll have a huge fair. Uh, knife, it's called. Well, makes <laughs> sense. Knife, the Zoling Blade Fair, um, where. Um, People who make knives themselves, so um, knife makers hand for handmade knives, they will present the knives, they will sell the knives, but we also want to have the Solingen companies who still exist, mm -hmm. that still exist, yeah. and, and produce knives, we, um, they will be there as well. And um, we also want to have uh, demonstrations of various kinds. So there will be demonstrations from fencing clubs, maybe from some HEMA clubs. Um, there will be demonstrations of, of blade making, stuff like that. Yeah, and maybe maybe even uh, somebody uh, showing how to make a stone knife. So, <laughs> wow, that will be yeah. really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we had this we had this for twenty years uh, in a um, a little bit smaller in our museum um, for twenty years before COVID struck, um, and it was um, the the knife makers show the Messermacher Messe. Um, it was one of the most important knife makers show in Europe already, but now we want to, of course, go one step further and we make it. We, we changed our location to a much larger venue and we have a, want to have it bigger and more beautiful and more people. So, uh, yeah, that will be that is the that is the, um, a big project that I'm working on at the moment. Yeah. Uh, OK. And are there like small projects that will be coming your way going? Uh, this uh, right up to Christmas? Or... There is um, uh, another huge project that we are working on, and I hope that this will be finished until Christmas. Um, we are working on our new homepage um, for the museum, and on that new homepage, we will present our um, online catalog. Yeah. So a couple of thousands of our, um, of our objects we already have integrated into our catalog, and then you, all of you guys, um, watching now, um, you can you can approach them like you know it by now from many other museums. Um, but we have, for example, um, already digitized all our Zolingen rapiers from the 17th wow. century, um, and they will be put online cross fingers uh, right before Christmas as a Christmas oh, wow. present. <laughs> Looking forward yeah. to that. Man. Yeah, if the if the IT, if everything in the IT works out the way it, it should, so <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. What yeah, happen? because it's really going to be interesting. I mean, I've um, I have been to Leeds Armory, and it was it was just um, overwhelming. So yeah. for it, 
for us to be able to see it in a digital way, that's yeah. gonna be good. At least uh, we'll be able to have like a virtual tour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. So Joe just asked a question. Uh, do you practice same as well? Mm. Not not regularly. Yeah. I have um, friends who who practice HEMA, and it's part of my job to organize workshops. Um, just by coincidence or by luck, we have a we have a, um, a gym just next door or a sports hall, whatever you call it, um, so, um, which um, belongs to the city of Solingen, and we are also part of the city, so we can use that for free. Um, so once again, before COVID struck, <laughs> we had one or two workshops um, for different bladed martial arts um at our museum so we had more money there two times we had kali workshops we had um shastavidya workshop uh Sikh, uh fencing system yeah um, stuff like that and um of course we also had several hema workshops there yeah so and then of course when i host a workshop there i also take part as a as a student as a practitioner um and sometimes i go to other people to train with them who do hema um but i'm not uh, I don't have an, uh, a regular HEMA training. Yeah. I have the, the Kali, and that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. You have already discussed about like uh, geometry, okay, um, with regards to uh, Kali training now, martial arts training now, and before. Yeah. I'm comparing like some of the things that we have in the in the martial arts community today and before like what are like the major similarities of like i would say um um major um statements or conceptions i would mm -hmm. yeah conceptions so like for example um like you what you mentioned last night uh, you already mentioned this last night regarding uh, the the martial arts before is all about combat. It's all about killing people, and the martial arts today, it's all about um, more mm. of like forms. Mm. So, um, are there any anything anything that you can say about uh, mm. com mm. in comparison? Yeah, um, I think, and this is what I what I already spoke about. Um, I think that um, we tend to have the idea that there was a time back in the days when, as you just said, martial arts was only about the combative aspects. Yeah, It was only training for fighting, for real application, for warfare or violence, street violence or whatever. Yeah. And then this is the idea that you often hear. Then they started to change. They were adopted. They were turned into sports or uh, into performative arts. And they were um, started uh, to being sold. Yeah. So this is a very negative view, of course. Yeah, we have an, we have a golden age where where the, it was pure and true. Yeah, and then it become, became more and more muddy over the years. Yeah, and <laughs> funnily is when you look at historical sources that the very idea that I just described that you can read and hear nowadays very often that that existed hundreds of years ago already. Yeah. So even in the 14th, late 14th century, you would you would read uh, in in a German fencing manual um, how the um, the author is disrespectful to other fencing teachers because he says, yeah, what they are teaching this is not real for combat application. Um, they are Leichmeister, so they are like you cannot take them serious. Um, this is they just do it to look good or probably to to sell it to people. Yeah. And I also read this uh, in a secondary. Uh, source in, in a um, book by Peter Lodge. I read this the very same argument you could find in China in the 17th century that people are saying, okay, our martial art, this is real combat application martial art, but what the other people are doing uh, on the market fairs, they they turned and, and violated martial art and turned it into an, uh, just a show act or something. Yeah. <laughs> and what I think is that all these various aspects of martial arts, that they always were there or at least as long as we have a, a historical understanding, they were always there. Yeah. Even when you, when you go to, to Egyptian murals where you, where you find wrestling depictions, yeah, it is clear that, that these wrestling depictions, they are not meant for warfare or for killing people. This is, this is for convivial wrestling, this is for sports. So you have, you have various aspects or various 
levels of meaning or dimensions of meaning, as I once called it. You have, very, have various dimensions of meaning that mar martial arts can attract. And they very often have them, they develop them, and they do it all over history. Yeah? And it's not the case. It's just not the case that if you go 200 years back, uh, there were no, no um, flowery things, there were no show things, and everything was about hardcore combat. This is simply not true. Yeah? And you, you can find examples for the opposite. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I was about I was about to ask if there is any like also parallel situations in in Southeast Asia and you already said about yeah. China. So yeah. that's quite yeah, yeah that's that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah because uh, sometimes you, you, you hear in, in in arguments also these days about that. So just to give a perspective also to people that that would be not the case. Yeah. And yeah. then the, the, the thing is like <laughs> I don't I don't really get the argument. Um if you say like, oh, this or that martial arts, it's only for show. Yeah, even if it is, uh, because if you do gymnastics or ballroom dancing or whatever, it's only for show too. So being for show <laughs> in itself is nothing bad. Yeah. Mm. The, the thing is just, are you honest with what you do? Do you know yeah. what you expect from your martial art? And does the martial art that you train, does it give you what you want from the martial art? Mm. Yeah. You you asked before, like, yeah, six, the, your journey in martial arts, it seemed to that it was geared towards the combative aspects and that is true because this is what i was interested in um, mm. if i if i had wanted to do i don't know real cool um fancy stuff i should have gone to other martial arts <laughs> yeah and that's and that's fancy is such a negative word but it's not because fancy means that it's fancy and it looks cool and if, if i see a video clip of somebody who could do like a beautiful butterfly 360 520 kick or whatever <laughs> i'm impressed because i cannot yeah, do it of course. Yeah. Yeah. it has it has a value in itself yeah mm. and as long as people know what they are doing i don't see i really don't see anything anything wrong with that yeah yeah it's just it's not it's not my way it's not what i would put my practice yeah in. yeah i mean yeah you mentioned about dance it's the same thing as actually in dance competitions because like, for example, ballroom, uh, there is a competition in ballroom, basically, that you're strict with all your figures and everything uh, with what you do. And there's also what we call a show dance, where you put acrobatic stuff. Yeah. Okay. So of course, those who compete in, in ballroom, okay, sometimes they actually don't like those who do the acrobatic stuff for the show dance, because they find it too showy yeah, yeah. <laughs> too yeah. Yeah, yeah it's exactly the same exactly yeah. Yeah. And those who do show dance basically they look down on those who do who, yeah. who, who, <laughs> too boring yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's the same <laughs> yeah. it's always i guess this is probably the most important thing um yesterday we were discussing when martial arts at which caveman martial arts started and i, I think i have to reassess i think true proper martial arts started at the moment where one caveman was telling his friends yeah the thing the martial arts that the other guys is doing this is real crap yeah i guess that is that is actually the point when when martial arts started because it's so prevalent but then it's as you say like I've been I've been um, doing bow shooting bows and arrows for a while and there you have the same the same there's the guys shooting recurve bows and there's the guys shooting uh, shooting compound bows and both is really cool I think but of course everybody is telling that the other one is this is not proper, proper business. <laughs> <There's> a, yeah <laughs> it's a typical like Hong Kong Chinese movie <laughs> is your master as good as my master or <laughs> something mm. like that so yeah. Okay. Um, is there in in for example in 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 your research besides the ones that we have already discussed? Are there any important uh, maybe concept or mindset or technique that you want to sh to share the our audience? Mm. Um, Something that you find relevant as well as today in martial arts? Yeah. Um, what I uh, think, what is what is striking is that the really the really important things are not shown. Yeah. The real skill. So now talking not as a researcher but as a martial artist. When we look, for example, at all these these uh, medieval and early modern fencing manuals, there you find many techniques yeah, and how to enter, and then you can roll around, and there you can break the elbow, and then you can. But of course, the technique is not the ability to apply. So the real interesting thing, and this is a quote from that I learned from from Grantohan Leogahe, um, 
The question is not the technique or the secret is not the technique, but how the technique is given to the student. So the real the real question is how do you teach people that they are able to apply? Yeah. Mm. And this is the same in martial arts nowadays and as it is when you just look at these historic books. Yeah. And I think this is really relevant for the personal practice and of each and every one of us. Yeah. The one thing is is the technique that might work or might not work, but in the end, if it works, depends on if you have the proper way of training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for me, as a as a trainer now, not as a researcher, not a, but as a as a Kali trainer, um, this is the the big question that I have to ask myself all the time. Do I try to instill the qualities that I want to see in my students? Do I try to instill them in the right way? Do I have the proper meta methodology of teaching mm -hmm. uh, for people to advance? in their skills yeah and this is this is so striking for me when i when i look at these books yeah it's like okay the techniques are there this is great and i, I guess you could fight with it but the real interesting stuff yeah like how do you train your footwork how do you train your distance how do you train your timing how do you train to work against um against the the, the counter pressure stuff like that um this is this is hardly described or you have to read it in between the lines yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. Um, it, it's like it's like they are basically like like modern um, martial arts books. If you go to a bookstore and you read a book on self defense, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. when yeah. he stabs you like this, then you have to go like this, and then you do like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can read that. You can even understand that. Oh, okay, I get the technique, but that doesn't mean that you are able to do it. Yeah. 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 yeah because it doesn't tell you how to train it, how to basically yeah. make it uh, make it part of you. So, um, how long have you been teaching um, Kali? For now. 17 years now. I started, 17 years? Yeah, I started um, teaching Kali in 2004 um, in Tübingen. As I said, um, Tübingen and Reutlingen is very um, close beside you, besides each other. And I was tra uh, training in Reutlingen mainly with Uli. It's only a short ride with a train. Uh, much shorter than any ride you would have to take in Manila, <laughs> I guess, to get somewhere to train. <laughs> so, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah, you would, you would, I guess you wouldn't count these two towns, not even as towns. It's just like really so yeah, yeah, middle-sized um, South German um, towns. Um, so I was training with Uli, but I was starting to teach at Tübingen University. So we had a university Kali club, there, oh, right. um, which was which was great um, because there was, of course, um, people, new people coming in fresh every half a year, every semester. We had new people coming in so at the beginning of the, of the semester the group always had like 50 people at the end there were like probably 20 left yeah and um but several um, of my students stayed with me then for a couple of years and became trainers themselves after a while yeah so there was there was a very good breeding ground um for us to to grow in a way yeah yeah it's yeah. It's, it's actually nice to teach in in um to form a martial arts group in the in the university yeah 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 because you've got like a lot of able bodies the problem the problem on the other hand is that usually people are away after three years or so yeah that's that's so, the only thing so they have to if you can give them enough that they can they can go away and take their training with them and mm -hmm. build on that and then it's perfect um yeah. sometimes it's a pity because people are there for like one year and they could become very good they are interested they are talented but they leave you before you have yeah, they enough before. that they, yeah. they can develop something. Yeah, and plus, if they are already like in the final stages of their of their program, and they do have like uh, they have uh, like uh, on the job training yeah. or internship and everything. Yeah. yeah, just like what happened to me as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to leave. I have to leave. Uh, I I have to give up training. Oh, Obviously. here's Dean. Hello, Dean. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for setting us up and thanks for the invitation to you again mm -hmm. so yeah uh, so during this time 17 years of teaching um did you change your approach or were there changes like the way you approach teaching the methods of how you deliver your 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 uh your methodology and yeah. also maybe some changes in the curriculum yeah so one one hundred percent one hundred percent i think uh, yeah everything changed in a way because this is um this is such a long time and i myself 
have grown uh, so much. So when I started to teach, um, I had been doing martial arts for a long time, but I had done Kali only for four years. And now I've done Kali for 21 years. So obviously <laughs> that's a huge difference in the way I Kali see and the way I perceive it. Then there's a difference because back then I was teaching these huge groups. As I said, sometimes we had 50 people at the beginning uh, of mm -hmm. the term. And now it's the absolute opposite. So now I teach just among a, among a circle of friends. We are six if everyone's there. This is not an open group. This is just some, mm -hmm. some uh, friends coming together to train. Yeah. And I can gear my training very specifically towards them. So at the beginning, to give people a good entry into Kali, I was trying, like I guess most people do, I was trying mm -hmm. to mimic the teaching of Uli. Yeah, I was yeah. trying to be as close to Uli and I was looking at the curriculum and what do we need to do and oh, I cannot give them this exercise because this would be a karate exercise and not a Kali exercise, so I have to keep that out and stuff like that. Um, but after after so many years, it completely opened up. So I don't have a I don't have a curriculum, uh, not at all. I don't have this written down anywhere. Um, yeah. They need to go through this or that phase or step, or they, they need to learn technique A, B, C, and D, and then they can have a new belt, and then they learn the next technique. It's not like this. It's just I have a group of friends. I know what they're able to do. I know where they want to go, and I know or I hope to know. Um, that I can give them some way to achieve their goals. Yeah. Um, so this changed radically. Um, and I think in a way my training became more and more primitive. <laughs> Prim primitive <laughs> yeah. so it's, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, well, yeah, as we say, like whenever you're a beginner in teaching, it's like when you're when you first um, drove a car, you're like this. Yeah. <laughs> And then eventually, so you get used to it, you add your personality into your teaching, yeah. you, you, you have a better feel now of how you deliver your, your uh, lessons or how you handle the class, you drive like this now. With one hour. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think every teacher goes through it. I mean, I did. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I myself, I went through it. Um, and it, it, is, it is really important as part of our progress as part of our own development yeah, yeah. so so when, when for example now that you're basically halfway through it did you did you incorporate i would say drills uh that is not kali into your training when you train your students did you incorporate something like um other athletic athletic based type of um of training to be able to build their attributes as well yeah the the kali was very the kali that i learned was was very open uh, from the beginning uh, this, yeah, was, so uh, it was it was straight pekita tersha definitely but but uh, uli my teacher um he already of course had his own background and it was it was very athletic based um from the beginning um so fitness played a huge part um, and was also that appealed to me when I came from from Muay Thai and from ancient karate. Um, I felt like okay, this is obviously people take that that serious. So um, I tried to to um, integrate this. And um, did I use drills? I I don't have anything that I would call a drill that I consciously took over from somewhere else. So it's okay. not it's not so much that uh, now here I have a new puzzle piece from i don't know taekwondo and now i do it like this it's it's more that things come up yeah is i see i give people an exercise then i see that they do mistake continuously so obviously mm -hmm. there seems to be a misunderstanding or they they are not able to do something and then i try to make up an exercise that will fill this gap and sometimes sometimes things come out of that that probably you would call a drill but yeah. um it's not it's not like uh, okay now now we do a drill that i that i saw in serada that i think is really good because i'm not that much working with the classic drills anyway nowadays so. Mm -hmm. okay so your approach in teaching is really more based on like um like sparring so um, playing 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 or playing yeah playing yeah yeah, yeah. I, call it, I call it playing giving giving people the exercises um oh, <laughs> 
first having a having a, a fundament um, that they're able to move in a certain way, that they're able to generate power, that they're able to have a proper footwork, stuff like that. And then I try more and more, and I even have to, I have to push myself to that, <laughs> not to fall back into the pattern of just yeah now just train this technique. Yeah, always find a dimension where something playful comes into mm -hmm. it. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, no matter how simple it is, don't I try not to make it a um, A then B. Yeah pattern but always an a or b so it's c d or e so that there, there's yeah, can, always yeah. no matter how, how soft and how playful it is and it doesn't have to be hard but i think there should always be a um, um playful an element of exploration i mentioned exactly exploration yeah. as you say exactly people have to explore it for themselves and i see that because my whole background in also in, in classic uh, martial arts whatever that is that's so in, in traditional martial arts um was very different yeah. in the karate training. Yeah, you just do like this. So something that was good when you asked me at the very beginning, what of my old training did I take over? The discipline and that, that's very good. But on the other hand, I I realized that I very often tend to fall back into this pattern. Yeah, so this okay. is the exercise A, then B. And now we do this exercise a couple hundred times or so. Yeah, And then I have to remind myself, ah, six, this is not the way you want to teach anymore. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, let them explore, as you said. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I think the allowing your students to explore as they learn is is really integral to their to their journey as well. So they 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 get to understand things better than rather than just memorizing yeah. sets and sets of movement. So yeah, yeah, that is something that I um, fascinated me with my training um, with Uli at the very beginning that I, I understood that he tried to, <laughs> to plant uh, the Kali in the people. Yeah. Yeah. So the Kali is, is a seed or it's a DNA that you put into people mm -hmm. and then you water it by training and then it grows, but it has to, to grow by themselves. Yeah. And each plant that comes out, even it comes from the same DNA, will look differently in the end yeah. because people develop in, in their own way. So it's, exactly. not about, it's not about copying what was yeah. before. It's about developing um, your own way, yeah, and hopefully have a living plant there afterwards. I mean, you can al also develop your own stuff, and it's shit. So, <laughs> 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 uh, uh, happens to all of us. Sometimes you're on the wrong track, maybe, and then you are happy if you have a good teacher or good friends. That that. Uh, that is true. Good. That is true. That is yeah. true. That is true. That is true. Yeah. So, uh, with. Uh, <clears throat> How long did you train with with Uli? Um, my whole time in, in Tübingen. So for 13 years, from 2000 to two, 2013, I was living there. I trained with him a couple of times a week. So uh, yeah, at least three times. Or I don't know. I was there very often. And then I moved away, um, um, and I of course went to his to his seminars. And now, unfortunately, in the last years, the COVID was, of course, mm, yeah. and in, the, in the time before, I was so involved at the museum um, that I hardly had any time anymore to go to the seminars. Um, so I hope I'll be able to. Um, yeah. Yeah. On that. That's, that's a problem sometimes. Work, work gets in the yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But for yeah, for 13 years, I trained with Uli. And um, we had um, um, Grant Tohon, Leo Gahe coming over to Europe, mainly to Germany, sometimes to Italy, sometimes to, to other All places. right. So how, um, how many times have you trained with uh, with Tohon Ga uh, Gahe? Um, no, 10, 12, 15, I don't know. Times. Yeah. Of, yeah. And also like uh, longer seminars, um, like week long seminar or for like four day seminars. Yeah. And I was, right. I was I was lucky because um, at some point I had um, enough training experience, and um, I could understand him well enough um, that I knew what he wanted <laughs> from us. So very often I was his demonstration partner for the stuff. Okay, all so, right. And that's of course also difference if you see the man doing it or if you feel it doing him on you. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I some you know, we, if we do have like guest instructors as well, and I was I'm, I'm learning, 
I would actually prefer to after watching him do after watching him do it, I would rather that basically I partner him. Yeah. Because it's really different when you feel the energy yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the movement itself. So Absolutely. yeah. So I mean you have you have partnered, you have been like in, in Japanese we call us the, uh, you you've been like assistant of uh or yeah um demo assistant of yeah. uh, GT. So what what was or your were your fondest memory? when you were like partnering him for yeah the, i guess uh, his quotes he has some memorable quote some of his quotes are so memorable because yeah, yeah. The same joke over and over and over again <laughs> but uh, sometimes he just he just uh, points things so clearly so i remember when we we're doing some breathing exercises that was in in italy yeah and we are doing breathing exercises in the morning on the beach very beautiful and like tai chi style and uh, looking at the sand um, and then some of the guys asked him yeah um, um Grant to home so how often should we do these breathing exercises yeah all the time otherwise you die <laughs> <laughs> I, liked it. I liked it a lot yeah. so, so stuff stuff like that yeah. um and of course his his uh, karaoke skills so <laughs> oh yeah i do hurt i i i heard because I've, i've got a one of my close friends here in the uk uh jim panlilio actually mm, trained yeah. with trained with uh gt so before he was he, he normally goes back to the philippines and stay there for one 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 or two months and just train with him every day so yeah he said that yeah one of the one of his uh uh skills outside cali is basically karaoke yeah it's psychological warfare so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we're not we're not used to it i don't know probably it's on the philippines probably it's everywhere yes. uh, so yeah. but of course in germany like i had i've been it's four years since i heard the last karaoke being sung, sung somewhere <laughs> so so um, and it, he, is, it, it is very popular now yeah. you've got a lot of um Philippine uh, Filipino families who live outside of uh, who live outside of the Philippines, they do have their own karaoke machine. Yeah. <laughs> and in, in in our parties, it's still part of it. So yeah. never get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> But of course, the only thing is over here, who has the who has the more guts to actually to sing? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So yeah. yeah, are there like are there any other like things that you want to share us with regards to training with GT and um, during during the seminars as well I think what is what is important um, when you when you look at, at him and at the way he teaches um, and he has been teaching over the, over the years is um, to understand that he I think something looks very closely at the people and decides what kind of exercises he wants to give them Yeah, mm -hmm. for whichever reasons and this leads to the point that um, different people at different times get different impressions of him of what his way of Kali is should be yeah. and then they take this impression they take this idea that they got back then they take that along yeah, and um, make an absolute out of it this is the right way yeah. and I've been I've been training with him often enough to know that there is no this is the this is the right yeah. way yeah <laughs> the the simple thing is is of course every time when you have beginners there or people come from other styles that do not have exp experience with blade work people would ask him so how do you have to hold a knife do you hold it like this with a step, or do you hold it like this yeah And in one seminar on the, on the first day, some people asked him that question. He was like, ah, you always have to hold it in sack sack because this is the way you can better attack and blah, blah. Um, and on the very next day, somebody asked him the same question. He was answer, uh, explaining to him, oh, of course, you have to hold it in Bacal because <laughs> sack sack is stupid. So uh, I don't know if he if it did just do it to, to uh, make the people understand better or if he just do it to make fun of the people or if he wanted people to to think for themselves that there are different aspects to it um so whatever the, whatever the <laughs> or all of that so whatever the background was um you have to reflect it for yourself yeah and you mm -hmm. shouldn't be too sure that what he gave you back then 
is the absolute truth that you might think it to be. Yeah, funny actually that you mentioned that because um, I think it was just a few, a couple of days ago, a few days ago, I can't remember now. Uh, Dean just actually interviewed uh, Bill McGrath, uh, Jared Riongi, and Philip Gilenas. Yeah. So they're basically like showing like, they're, they're comparing basically how they learned uh, Pikiti from Kitty. So now you can see like, uh different people from maybe from different time as well learned it differently dif learned it differently and even my my friend actually could attest to that so he was actually explaining that yeah G, the gt basically thought this group or these people in this area in slightly different way than 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 yeah. than uh than the uh the more recent ones and also the way he trained him and the how he saw gt training other like instructors as well so it, it's it's it is it is really important for people to understand that especially learning from a founder learning from from one person there's no such thing as you you won't be able to say that you learned everything no that you can you can say basically that you you hold like the absolute truth to, no. <laughs> to, to beat it. and that goes with any art because that also happened in aikido and, no. and also in other FMA styles and in, no. in other traditional arts. So, and this is one of the things that sometimes drive like the FMA community at the moment. We no. have a lot of this type of bickering that is happening that, no. nope, okay, we, this, is, this is what, this is what, this is what how the founder taught us. This is, yeah. this is what it should be. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And then yeah. talking to somebody down the line, learning from the founder maybe about 10 years after 20 years after when he yeah. changed so yeah. Yeah. yeah and the next generation has to to change it uh, for itself again anyway yeah so i had the same experience when i was in in uh, wing chun i started uh, training wing chun when i was 14 years old and i did this till i was 19 so for five years in my youth and of course there it was the same it was always about like yeah who learned when from yip man and which which yeah. wing chun is the the truest yeah and the problem is even if there were such a thing which i don't believe but even mm. if there were such a thing so this is like the 100 percent true yip man wing chun and this is like 80 percent yip man even even if you train the 100 percent my trust them be that another guy who trains the 80 percent true version is still the better fighter <laughs> because he has the better training methods and he trains more diligently and he's just more talented yeah. or whatever so so the the whole argument is absurd and so far because people assume that okay if my thing and this mm. again is a mythic thinking like the just mm. like the geometry thing if my version of the martial art is the truest the purest the closest to the origin then i will win the fight no why yeah, yeah. probably thing. probably the other one has a very bad martial art but he's he can hit friggin hard so <laughs> he might still win yeah um but it, it plays a huge huge role in our in our minds as, as yeah, it does. in the martial arts community yeah it does it does it does, it does. Mm. and yeah i mean like like in fma it's basically one of the major point of uh arguments yeah. <laughs> even, today, even today yeah i mean i've learned basically to live with like different subsystems in in, a, in an art because yeah. uh early early on like with my experience in aikido it was just like it's just another thing because definitely, for example, like with, with, with in Aikido, you've got all the major disciples of, uh, of Osensei who learned from him from different eras or different like years. And of course, as the year grows by, as he grows old, as he grows older, there are some things that change. He became more fluid. He, he, his, his, uh, his intention changed at, also at one point when it comes to self-defense, because like before, when he was in the Aiki Jiu Jitsu, he was pretty much like doing death match. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, and then suddenly he stepped out of it. Then, of course, the way he approached Aikido now has changed. The way he does mm. his technique has changed. So, you can't really like say this is basically 100% mm. uh, Ueshiba or Osensei Ueshiba because mm. it depends. Mm. It depends really. So, mm. that's why to me, Having to learn from from the different substyles is a way for me to be able to understand also like us and say. Mm. So because you've got like different different um, disciples 
expressing o s e n s e i s teaching the way they want it because like some are some are uh, practitioners of kenjutsu some are practic- practitioners of ai jutsu mm. and some are more of like uh, zen um practitioners so they, they they would take different things from o s e n s e i definitely mm. and mm. that's how that's how they're gonna that's that's how they're gonna mm. teach it according mm. to according to how they took The yeah. Lesson. yeah, how they how they took, but then um, inevitably they will transform it themselves, exactly. even if they think that they remain true to the source. Exactly, yeah? because we cannot exactly copy it, uh, copy anything. So they will transform it. Um, yeah. So we cannot we cannot go back to to the origin um, anyway. I guess yeah. So mm. these yeah things transform, and then. I think what is also important in these discussions, and this is now again from the research side, something um, then ben, that Ben Judkins, um, an American researcher on martial arts, a very very good one, um, has um, pointed out again and again that martial arts are obviously mainly also about com- creating communities. Yeah, they are creating about creating close knit groups yeah. of friends of like minded people who define themselves as yeah we are the ones who belong together. Yeah. And so the discussion about the the technical level, yeah, sometimes it's only an excuse to create this community and to tell you who is who belongs to your group and who doesn't belong. Yeah, because if we look at at the various branches of a martial arts, now talking about Pekka Tisha, for example, um, then within one branch, two trainers yeah, who spent even might be friends spent years with yeah. the other might still have very different i n t e r p r e t a t i o n s they are still belong to one branch and they mm. will say yeah both of us we're doing this or that kind of c a l i yeah whereas a trainer from another branch might be much closer to that one yeah, yeah by coincidence yeah. or by the way they were brought up or something yeah, that's yeah. True. but still still they separate them themselves from each other yeah because they orientate towards an yeah Origin or imagined origin or whatever. Yeah. So it seems to be very important for humans and for martial artists to create these groups and to tell themselves, yeah, this is us. This is the others. Mm. Yeah. I think it's 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 uh, normal basically for people who share the same core values basically to start uh, congregating towards yeah. each other. So. Which is, I mean, I think this is true in in anything, yeah. in anything, not just in martial arts. So, yeah. Okay. Um. Um. What What message do you want to leave to the FMA community? It's one of the things that we basically ask near the end of the interview. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Have fun, hit hard. <laughs> That's nice motto, actually. <laughs> That's just it, I guess. And um, yeah, my personal message is, of course, if you come to Germany, if you come to the middle of Germany, Middle West. So this is the Cologne area. Cologne is the biggest city, the biggest well-known well-known city. Ah. Come over and uh, pay a visit uh, to our museum, the German Blade Museum. Um, there's lots of blades. You will not be disappointed. I promise mm. you. <laughs> oh, okay. That's an open invitation, guys. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the before the end of the year, we're hoping to be able to see the your 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 website. Yeah, yeah. your website. Yeah. So, um, now what else have I forgotten? Something? No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, on that note, I would like to thank you very much, Six, for uh, thank coming. You. As being our guest in in FMA discussion, so um, it's 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 really interesting that you managed to bring um, bring out a lot of topics, a lot of uh, yeah points of discussion, also coming from the research mm-hmm. side, yeah, well, historical mm-hmm. perspective as well. So which is which is I think one of the things that the community also needs, yeah, to to be able Thank to give better perspective on certain things yeah. as well. Yeah, I hope I hope it was fun. Thank you very much once right. again for inviting yeah. me, and uh, it was a pleasure to yeah. talk with you. And yeah. um, yes, hope to see you guys again sometimes. And um, yeah. thanks and bye to everyone, to everyone who watched. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much.
Okay. Thank you. Nice to meet you here. Stay bye safe. Bye. 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 Right, so there you go, folks. Uh, FMA discussion episode uh, 204 with six Wetzler. So we do hope that you uh, like the discussion points that we made tonight, especially when it comes to the historical part of um, uh, FMA and all the other and all the other aspects that basically uh, goes with FMA. So until next time. So remember, please. Uh, my interview with Paolo Pagaling has moved uh, from 7 o'clock Manila time on Thursday, okay, um, September 30, uh, to 7 o'clock a.m. Manila time. So that means this, uh, that's going to be 12 midnight here in the UK, and it's going to be around 7 o'clock uh, Eastern time, U.S., okay? So hope to see you then. Right. Stay safe. Guru Tom Kenya signing off.